go. <laughs> that was good. Now let's record. I feel like that's from something. Okay. All right, sweet. Ready? Yeah. All right. We made it. We're here at Sagebrush Coffee. I'm so excited to talk to my friend Matt Kelso. This is awesome. My volume did go up. I didn't know what would happen when I was going to interview him, and my volume went up. This is exciting. Matt is a foodie. He is a roast master at Sagebrush, an entrepreneur, and a church elder at Grace Bible Church. So thanks so much for letting oh, me come interview you, my man. My pleasure. Awesome. Um, so, Matt, you and I have known each other for about 20 years, right? Yeah, I think so. I think since I was I a teenager. I think you were like just out of high school. Yeah. So almost 20 years. Yeah. That's amazing. We're old. We, oh, man. <laughs> Time marches on. Yeah. Uh, I always think of this when I think of our relationship is that when you, we had two people come to our, the small group. I used to be in a small group with you. Um, at the same time, our friend Russ. Yeah. And me and the way you the way you introduced Russ was hey here's Russ he's a really smart guy you might know talking to what him say. you might notice Russ is a very smart guy I was like yeah he's really smart and then the way you introduced me was this is Bill and one time at a summer camp we were doing a skit and then he randomly jumped through a window <laughs> <laughs> I was like that's that's great I that's, like having I still remember you jumping through that window like just Flew through a window without knowing what was on the other side. I just remember I was about eight feet away, and I was like, that was the trajectory. And I was like, let's, <laughs> let's go for it. Why not, you know? That's way better than Russ. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Russ. <laughs> I love you, buddy. Yeah. I love you, buddy. Your beard is better than mine. Yeah. Don't worry better about it. Better than ever. Yeah, it really is. It's a theologian-level beard. All right, <laughs> awesome. Cool, so I wanted to ask you about um, Sagebrush. And uh, I think a lot of the conversations are just about how the business has gone and how you've developed it are really interesting. I feel like you're good at succinctly explaining that. So can you explain what Sagebrush is and how you got started and all that? Yeah, so um, probably a decade or so ago, I started roasting coffee as a hobby. And um, as anything happens, you start to get more and more into it. And then you start to spend more and more money on it. And you're like, oh crap, this is getting really expensive. <laughs> so. I had this brilliant idea of, hey, if I just start a business, then I can deduct all my equipment and use it as a tax deduction. And as my wife and I started going down that path, we're like, well, let's just go after it. So that um, holiday season, we launched the business, we sold to friends and family, we made way more money than we thought we could ever do. Um, and so the next year, we kind of moved and put the whole business on pause and July rolled around. And we're like, let's go after this. And so we built a website and started selling out of our garage, roasting out of the garage. And here we are eight years later, and this shop we've completely outgrown. We're in the process of moving to a new one. Um, I've quit my full-time job and I'm doing this, and um, it's just been a huge blessing, so. That is so exciting. It's so great also that there's a roast out there being promulgated throughout the country from Sagebrush that is less than after Full City Plus. Yes. That's the exciting thing. Preserving a lot of the flavors, I love it. Yeah. Um, beautiful, and your business, one thing that's interesting about it is it's mostly online. I understand that most coffee shops start with the physical storefront and yeah. then move, but. As, as a kind of, you know, when I started out in my garage as a hobby, you don't really know anyone in the food industry or in the coffee industry. And over eight years, you start to meet people and everyone I interact with and tell the story, I just told, are like, well, how did you start online without a coffee shop? Like, how did you get customers? And so, um, I, I mean, it's really the grace of God more than anything else that we've been able to do it. But really, as much of a coffee company as we are, we're an online marketing company. And and we've kind of jumped on the, you know, when I started the business, I was like, hey, I want to learn as much about coffee as I possibly can. And so I just bought books and listened to audiobooks and read blogs and read articles and just tried to, uh, if I'm going to sell this, I want to be an expert. and. You know, I hand books to my wife and she's like, there's no way I'm going to read this. I'm like, no, it's super interesting. And she's like, no, it's not. Um, and so there is an element of just really loving the whole industry from the top to the bottom, from the, mm. the planting the seed all the way through people that are beyond the process of me that are opening coffee shops and stuff. And so just a love for that and a fascination with that has grown my knowledge. And I just try to push that out to people as much as possible. And so... The idea is as much information as we can give people in their coffee buying experience, more likely 
they're going to be an educated coffee buyer and want want mm. some of the products we sell. And so that's kind of been the whole focus. And and we're starting to get enough content eight years down the road to be able to feel like we do have good content on our website that is providing people the expertise that we've picked up over the last eight years. That's fantastic. That's why I got into home roasting is because you can always grow more and it's so much fun to discover a way to refine your technique or a way to go a little bit farther with the flavors you're working oh, with. Oh yeah. Like I tell people all the time who, you know, I'll have customers who will email me and say, I'm just getting into grinding and trying to learn this. And I'm like, there is no end in the way that you can become obsessed about this thing. <laughs> like, like just when you think you're the most obsessed person in the world, you run into someone who takes a whole nother step and a whole nother layer of like measuring, repeating, monitoring, um, logging, like all of the things to make sure that their coffee is as consistent and, and flavorful as possible. And, and the story is you want to, like you're, at some point in your life, you're gonna have a sip of coffee and you're gonna be like, that is the best thing coffee I've ever had in my entire life. And you don't want that to be a one-time thing. Mm. And so that's where the obsession comes in is, like, what did I do to get there so I can get there every single day? Oh, absolutely. That's a great point. And I feel like this is, this attitude towards coffee and towards a lot of other things like beer and that kind of thing in general, it's been increasing. It's a trend oh, in yeah. our country. Yeah, I think, I mean, years. you look at, you know, probably even, like, date back to when we first met, how many chef-owned restaurants were there? Mm. Like it wasn't, it was kind of a thing, but it really wasn't. And now all the good restaurants are owned by chefs. And that's because the customers are looking for the, that flavor profile, whatever it is, they want something that just tastes amazing. And if you, you start with the person that's producing it, whether it's the coffee roaster, whether it's the chef owned, like anyone could open a coffee shop and sell someone else's coffee. But there's a whole different thing when you're saying, Hey, I want to build the coffee to be the profile and flavor that I love. Mm. Um, and so that's starting to be what's growing. That's why breweries are popping up all over the place and not just bars. That's why chef owned restaurants are popping up all over the place and not just chains. Uh -huh. And that's why coffee roasters are because everyone's trying to, to infuse their, their palate into the product they're selling. That personal connection makes it that much more meaningful too. Oh yeah. Oh, that's fantastic, man. And you are eventually pretty soon here going to move to a storefront. So we're excited about that. Yeah. I. You know, nothing happens as fast as you wanted to. I think we signed a lease two months ago and we submitted papers to the city yesterday. Um, if this happens sometime before next summer, I'll be ecstatic. Uh, <laughs> so, so we'll see. <laughs> awesome. Okay, first of all, this hood sounds like only the inhaling part of the Darth Vader voice. <laughs> and it's freaking awesome. Oh yeah, all right. This is super exciting. So, so we roast on so there's two kinds of roasters you could have. You could have drum roasters or fluid bed. And what we use primarily are fluid bed roasters. Um, what we use right now are fluid beds. We're gonna get a drum roaster eventually. They um, create two different flavor profiles. A drum roaster is gonna use um, an exothermic reaction where the heat is being transferred by the heat of the drum itself where an air roaster or a fluid bed roaster is gonna use an endothermic reaction where the temperature of the room creates the heat from the inside out. Um, air roasters generally create a brighter flavor because you're gonna be less likely to caramelize and jar the beans. Ah, um, interesting. Drum roasters, you can create the flavor profile you get from a fluid bed on a drum roaster. It's just a lot harder. Ah. So, We've gotten to a point in size where we just can't, air roasters have a very limited size. Like, you can only really get a one kilogram air roaster and be effective. Oh. So that's why we have five right now. We actually have six of them that we generally run. Um, they all have names. Yeah. Such as Basil, Darnell, and Wanda. Um, but you can only get so much volume done doing it this way and we've just kind of outgrown it so mm. we're going to get a drum roaster here at the new location and work to continue to make sagebrush coffee quote-unquote flavor profiles using a different roaster fantastic and I'm we'll keep these like we're going to set up these so we'll have some coffees we may only roast on the air roaster because that's the flavor profile we want some we may only roast on the drum and we might have some trade in it cool it smells so amazing too oh yeah i love the smell of roasted coffee it's like 
baking bread, only better. Oh, that's a great way of putting it. It's a smell you don't really smell any other time. Yeah. It's fantastic. How many times I vacuumed the shaft out of one of these candles? <laughs> Mine just ends up spread around my backyard. Yeah. So this is a much better method. It's a trick to be able to vacuum the shaft and not the coffee bean. <laughs> Oh, it's so beautiful! It's so much more even, too. Oh my gosh. That's what's up right there. All right, so we're back. We roasted. It was tons of fun. Matt's a much better roaster than I am. Good news. Good news for you. I'm out of practice. <laughs> <laughs> Still much more in practice than I would ever be. This is a coffee beer that I made previously. It's actually with a different bean. Um, and uh, we tried it before, and uh, the yeast that works really well with it, it's got the California ale yeast, which I think really um, brings out the maltiness, rounds it out, it brings out hop characteristics too, works really well with porter styles. So let's get into this, and um, I remember a critique that we had last time was that the coffee tasted stale, which is a really interesting thing that we need to learn to counteract. So. Cheers. Cheers. All right. No COVID. Mm. So tasting this a little later, I'm hit with the impression that the coffee's blended more with the malt. It's really interesting. Yeah. Um, I don't taste the flavors as sharp, but it's definitely there, almost in the front of the experience. What's your impression with it? Give me a minute. Yeah. Sip as much as you need to. Yeah, the coffee um, definitely comes through in the front of the palate. Mm -hmm. um, it's the beer itself. I think is more bitter in the finish, mm. and I think that's good. Mm -hmm. um, I would agree. You is this the one that you said you thought had too much coffee flavor? No. Okay. Because yeah. I'm like, I don't think this has too much coffee flavor. Like, no. I think this has a very good mix of the the chocolate and coffee tones to it. I agree. I think it's really balanced. And towards the end of the um, palette, you can kind of get this afterness of kind of a bitter, darker roast of the yep. barley that's in it as well, which is really nice complement to the coffee, I think. Yeah. I think that the porter is just a really great style for this because the stout includes roasted barley which is so much roast character that it almost outbalances something that's a lighter roast, like we discussed before. Right. So, how about the staleness? I don't taste it. What we tasted last time, I don't taste this time. Yeah, right? Yeah. It's really interesting. It's almost gone. Maybe a little bit in the aftertaste, um, mm -hmm. but that could just be the barley, too. Mm-hmm, it could. It's almost like a, um, like a graininess, like kind of a little little bit of a, not char, but almost like a bitter bite yep. of really toasted grain. That's really the fascinating. The nose is really good too. Yeah, it smells the hops and the coffee mixed together in a nice way. Mm -hmm. There's a tiny bit of yeast character there. No, that's a, that's a marketable coffee porter right there. <laughs> that's so much fun. Yeah. I wonder about the aging and how the aging mellowed the um, stale, the sort of staleness of it. Just to be clear, we tasted this earlier and it was like coffee that might have gotten left out after a while. And that's yeah. a common issue. So this is the same batch? Yeah. The, I mean, that was six months ago, right? Right. Wow. Yeah. I didn't realize that. It is really interesting. That well, it's aged and tastes less stale. Yeah, right? <laughs> That's because there's yeast in there. That's why brewing is fascinating. That's it's a living crazy. organism. It keeps doing stuff. It, you know, and actually, like if you're brewing and you make an error with something, yeast can actually clean up a lot of the errors. Or That's if it, interesting. yeah, or if it ferments under stress and releases. Man, we should put yeast in coffee. That would be a lot easier for me to roast. Seriously, just fix everything. Yeah. If you need to enter a brewing competition, just wait another year. Just and wait another year. <laughs> That's not gonna work with coffee. No, not at all. <laughs> no. Uh, quite the opposite. Of course, IPAs and stuff you want to drink while they're fresh, but yeah. But okay, so that's really interesting. Well, let me finish. I'm going to finish this sip, 
And then, yeah, it's just... That gross thing of cleaning out my closet. Oh, man. That's a good idea, dude. I was going to go rinse, but I'll just do this. No, I'm too lazy. I'll just drink terrible. <laughs> <laughs> terrible whatever that yeah. was. So to go on... Coffee water? Yeah, water. right? Oh, in other words, decaf, right? Yeah. Coffee water. <laughs> useless brown water. Yeah. That's David uh, Letterman's line. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. So this is the one that had both. So this is the coarse grind at the end of the boil in the hot kettle while the beer is cooling off. And then uh, also uh, espresso grind in secondary fermentation. Okay. So we'll see. So the espresso grind has a lot more surface area and is going to have a lot more extraction. Okay. Um, there you go. The coarse grind re like extracts very differently. Oh, that's good to know. That's part so, of why. And this is expected to be pungent. I mean, yeah. you could smell. It's like somebody yeah, this is through espresso up your hair on your chest. <laughs> but this strikes me as it's like drinking espresso that's just very dense or something. I yeah. don't know. That's what the equivalent of But it it's not me. even espresso because of the brewing method. It's like right. drinking cold brew concentrate. There you go. Like there you go. Um, which you really shouldn't do. <laughs> no, it's not a good. This is not the best beer. No. But it's interesting. You gotta, you got, you've gotta analyze your failures as well as your successes. So we've got two different beers, two different methods, two different amounts of coffee, and two different levels of success. So this, yeah. this one, it's just too pungent for me. It overwhelms the other flavors. So when you added the coffee in the second portion of it. What was the temperature? Because this kind of tasted like it was extracted cold. It was. Nice uh, palate. It was room temperature. Yeah. So cold. So that's going to get a little bit more. It's going to be more of a sour flavor to it. Mm -hmm. um, and that might be what you're describing as pungent. Might not necessarily be the quantity, but the way it was added to it because um. it was at room temperature. Interesting. I feel like that that sourness would be mitigated if the roast was darker. Is that are my instincts right there or no? Maybe. Um, I mean, you used our Nicaraguan for this, right? Yeah. That's so this a was... sour coffee in and of itself. Mm -hmm. um, I think if you used a different, a less fermented coffee, you could probably get away with doing what you did mm, and not have it lose. It, and it is less of the roast profile and more of the coffee bean itself because that was a mm -hmm. that's the funky process it's for highly fermented coffee and you're getting that mm. from what we're drinking and also i can't tell if this is just if this is partially in the feeling residual feeling that it leaves behind in my mouth but that's I, the espresso grind oh see that's, i think i sense that texture yep. and it's almost it's a lot more raw too to yeah me. yep that's the espresso grind. Mm. If, but if you ground it coarse, it might taste um, just watery. It might just not taste mm. as good. So it's a balancing act. Interesting. Uh, and you're kind of inventing a way to extract the coffee flavor from it. And so um, it's just, it's gonna take some trial and error. That's what it's all about. That's why we do it when we have time. Yeah. That's fantastic. Well, uh, Matt, I gotta go, but thank you so much for everything you've helped me oh, with. Oh, no, it was fun. Yeah, Bye. super fun. You're yeah. super, so I said this off camera, but this guy is smooth when he talks about business. <laughs> it's smooth as silk, some Kelso fine silk going on there. <laughs> Whatever, man. <So> <laughs> <laughs> All right, All right. thanks, buddy.